And so when you come to NAB Paclitaxel and how they've most recently done with Mark Szynski's study, the phase three study, you know, the first thing people said was, well, it's still Taxol, right? You're just changing the delivery, whether it's, you know, albumin bound versus cremophore bound. Uh, why should there be any difference? True. So that's why the FDA said, well, you can use response rate as an endpoint yeah. because OS should be the same, right? I mean, it should be. And after a thousand patients, a thousand, you know, uh, not a small study, and a lot of people said that, that was not resources utilized well. Uh, 41%. Yeah. I mean, remember, carbo taxol avastin was 35% right, yeah. in a more favorable response population. Right. And, uh, you know, the subset of squamous was over 400 patients in this 1,000 patient study. So astounding to me. And yeah. uh, again, based on what we see as far as the presentation of patients, and even when choosing drugs right now, when we look at even some of the immunotherapies, will response drive yeah. our choice yeah. in the light of no, no survival? And I think that's something that people have not adopted as much as I thought would happen. That's right. been surprising to me. Uh, the other aspect is, is that you, you touched on this over 70 population. You can look at subsets, and we always do. And gosh, if any one of us keep looking at these forest plots, we start getting dizzy. But the survival in the over 70 population that had over 150 patients, yeah. more than 10% in this, in this study, was almost 20 months yeah. versus 10, doubling 20. Yeah, that's right. 15 versus 10, 12 versus 10, 20. I mean, if I were sitting there as, as a CEO of a company, I'd be forced to have to test that, right. I, you know, because later, if I didn't, I'd be looked upon as stupid. Yeah, keep in mind, that. the average age of a lung cancer patient is 71. Right. So this is, this is the, you know. So the, that's how I kind of organize those things in my mind. Do I think they're all good regimens? Yes. Do we have preferences in our, in our system that we've listed? Yes. We do list uh, carboplatin and nabpaclitaxel as one of our preferred regimens for squamous. Yeah, I think that you touched upon an issue with the response rate being 41%, which is so important, especially in a group of patients who can be complete, you know, very symptomatic from their disease. And so we, we, have, we have adopted this as well uh, based on a response rate. And I don't know if I can under, uh, explain the uh, biological logically the 70 population and why there's almost a doubling in overall survival. Um, but other things, you know, the, the need not to premedicate with steroids with this drug um, and the, the, the AE profile for us has, has, has been very helpful. Paul, your, your thoughts on this drug and, and using it versus gemcitabine-based regimens versus solvent-based paclitaxel? Right. So outside of the limited scope of the regimens that have been tested head-to-head, -head, uh, I think as Ed was saying and what you've mentioned, <clears throat> we have regimens that are all reasonably effective. If you put them side by side and look at the response rate, PFS, OS data, they're all very similar, except for some outliers like the subset analysis in uh, Mark Szynski's trial uh, for Abraxane and carboplatin. Um, and so, uh, and that's going, that's formally being tested uh, in, a, in a more rigorous fashion within this specific population. Uh, the hazard ratio for survival in the over 70 population was, as Ed had said, it was very large. And while you could argue it's a subset analysis. The hazard ratio was not 0 0.7. This is nearly 0 0.5. 0 0.58, I think, was the hazard yeah. ratio. So there may very well be something that's there. For me, selection, absent the ability to provide a lot of, or absent the head-to-head -head data, comes down to questions of sequence in terms of the overall care for the patient, which I think we'll get into in a little bit. And also the uh, side effect profile for these agents. Uh, Carborobraxane, uh, the data certainly are that uh, its rates of neuropathy in particular are better, but the rates of anemia and thrombocytopenia are substantially higher. They are almost threefold higher yeah. uh, into the 20% uh, range for grade three, four anemia and thrombocytopenia. And for my patient population, the patients I see, the anemia can be a bit challenging. Uh, in addition, I think the back-to-back, -back, at least the way that it was studied, the, the sort of nonstop chemo right. for carborobraxane. Uh, very few. I've not encountered one patient who can tolerate that uh, at any sustained level. Are you doing a, a day, you know, <laughs> given the anemia, uh, the myelosuppression factor, and we've had the same issue here, yeah. the studies and even the, the maintenance study we'll talk about that we're participating in is, is a weekly regimen all the way through the induction regimen. Yeah. Um, are you uh, doing a day one eight schedule with these <laughs> patients? Are you doing a weekly when then are day one eight fifteen on a twenty eight day schedule? How, how are you? How yeah, are you? so usually we settle on uh, two on one off okay. for patients who might be able to tolerate a three on uh, one off. But there's that break that needs to to be there. I think, and one can argue that, you know, if you were to not give the 
the sort of four weeks nonstop per cycle, that there might be some decrement in efficacy. But 46% of the patients on the trial required a dose reduction yeah. in uh, Abraxane. And so you do have some, you, you get a sense from the data that yes, not everyone's able to tolerate it, and yet we still saw this difference. Right. Um, so I still think that there is something there that w is going to be fleshed out more. Right. And as you had mentioned, in a patient who's very symptomatic where you need to maximize the chance of some uh, substantial degree of shrinkage, I think that you're left with the data, which is the response rate that you got to go with. I right. Think, so. Um, so you talked a little bit about the lack of head-to-head -head comparison between some of these regimens. We had some data at ASCO last year presented comparing uh, carboabraxane versus uh, gemcitabine-based regimen, carbogem, specifically in the squamous cell population. Can you just talk a little bit about that? And does that change things at all for you? That's right. So Yang and colleagues at a group uh, from China had compared uh, carboabraxane head-to-head uh, -head in a randomized phase two with uh, carboplatin and gemcitabine. About 127 patients enrolled in total, so a little north of 50 per arm. Um, and while there was a trend towards improvement in terms of response rate, PFS, OS, this was not significant. The important thing to note is that the way that the regimen was given was also different. So it was not carbobraxane given in the fashion that was reported um, in the larger head-to-head -head trial for carbotaxel. It was uh, abraxane given at 135 milligrams per meter squared. Uh, I think it was day one, day eight, and then uh, carboplatin given at AUC5. So again, the dose density is different. The dosages were different. Uh, so comparing this to the what we're used to in terms of carbobraxane dosing and schedule uh, is very difficult to do. Uh, so a trend towards improved outcomes, but not significant. That answer against platinum gemcitabine still has not been addressed as a result. Yeah, I think that the, the study certainly we could glean some insight that there may be a little bit preferential activity with the carbobraxane in terms of response rate and PFS, but didn't seem to approach statistical significance. Right. Again, showing a response rate though north of 40 yeah. in the carbobraxane arm, right. and, and to me that again is, 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 is so important, uh, for, especially for a patient that we encounter with advanced squamous cell who tends to be very symptomatic. Right. Uh, Ed, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think one of our challenges in doing a head-to-head -head is we don't know what the dose or schedule right. of the control That's arm right. is. Right. That's right. Uh, you know, when I have folks who, who ask me, well, how do you dose carboplatin platin and, and abraxane, and I say, you know, because it's very strict, <laughs> and I say, well, yeah, I think you can drop a dose, and we do do a two on one, uh, one week off. Right. Uh, schedule and drop the doses, and like, oh, well, that's you shouldn't do that. I'm like, okay, so what would you propose <laughs> to use otherwise? Right. Why well, use carboplatin and gemcitabine? And what dose of gemcitabine and schedule exactly do you right. use of gemcitabine? Right. That's right. Well, okay, I want to use carbotaxol. What dose and schedule do you use of, you know, you're not, taxol is dosed at two or three dose levels below what its original right. intended right. dose was. Uh, and the same with gemcitabine. Right. So, you know, it's all art of oncology, art yeah. of medicine right. stuff. And it's just interesting to hear the, the rigid adherence to some where there's this very generalized acceptance to others right. just because we're used to. It's like that old sweater, you know. Right. You don't think it looks ratty, but, you know, everyone else does when you wear it out, you know. But right. you like it because it's comfortable. And sometimes, you know, it's time to change. I think that's an important point, uh, that individualized medicine, where medicine is both an art and a science, and, and having that in the balance and walking that tightrope when you're seeing patients. We talk about individualized or personalized approaches for targeted therapies, but we have to have indiv individualized approaches for chemotherapy regimens and schedules when we see these patients. So I think that's a, an excellent point. Um, let's move